Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, again, we're, we're springboarding in this little series uh, from this little book, Joining Jesus on His Mission, uh, Becoming Everyday Missionaries, if you will, and, and today our focus is, is just practice, 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 <laughs> five practices uh, for, for the journey. Uh, if you ever um, open up the sports section, uh, and, and some may not do that, okay, but oftentimes you'll find a coach talking about a guy, and, and he starts to say, you know, he... He, he has great practice habits. Have you ever seen that? I, I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, he's got great practice habits. And, and, and what that means is that this kid, he, um, he has these disciplines that he does. And, and, and it's just part of his life. He, he, has, he, he's, he does these disciplines, whatever they might be, to make him better at his sport. And, and it can be different for, for different kinds of sports, right? Uh, and, and so if, he's, if, he ha- if he practices well, if he has these disciplines, he's going to get better and better and better. Because when you do those disciplines, right, you improve. We know that's a good thing in our lives, right? If we have practices or disciplines, and usually they're not suggestions. Because suggestions is like, well, you can do them if you're not, if, or not, it's, it's no big deal. But when we're talking about practices or disciplines, it's, it's, it's a little different. Last few months, um, I put together uh, something I call the list of practices for myself personally. I, I um, kind of needed that, and, um, or the list of disciplines. Uh, and at the top, I, I put this. I put, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. You see, we should never forget that as Christians, uh, God's in this picture, and he, and he says he makes his home within us. And the text says that, that, that God gives us not a spirit where, where we, we're afraid of things, but a spirit rather in his love, but we're empowered to this place of self-discipline to practice disciplines that, that empower us to, to walk more and more with God and Jesus Christ, uh, whatever valley that, that, that we're going through. Um, I think a great example of that, by the way, is, is when Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of God, the church are the people of God, Right? And, and, and we tend to think, oh, hell's attacking us, right? So, so, we, so it's a defensive action. But you know, just think about it in a minute. All right, gates, gates are not an offense. They're a defense. And so the idea here is that we're storming the gates of hell. And it can't hold us back. See, God didn't give us a spirit of timidity, as if we're afraid of the gate. No, no, we have Jesus Christ. We have the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're attacking hell, see? And its gates cannot keep us out. We're gonna overcome it. So God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And right beside that, beside that at the top of these list of practices or, or, or disciplines, right, I wrote by grace alone. Because it's, because we tend to put ourselves under a heavy burden. We tend to, to, to just go to despair when, when, when we don't measure up. When even though these practices and disciplines we're working on, uh, and, and we want so much to get better when we fall flat on our face, what happens? It's all by grace. In fact, only in grace. Grace is kind of the, um, the power source for it all, the, the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. All right, that's grace, his undeserved love. I, I, I've often said that, that, that as, as, as parents, you know, we, we will not have a lasting effect on our children if we just bang them over the head with something. They've got to know that we have unconditional love towards them. Then our words might have some meaning in their life as they move on, right? If they know that we love them unconditionally, as they get older, they might want to listen to those words. They might want to even live by them a little bit. We know the unconditional love of God in Jesus Christ. It's why we do what we do. And yes, we fall fall flat on our face, but every single day we have a brand new beginning. We have a brand new beginning to begin a new Christian disciplines or practices. Gives us a spirit of power, of self-discipline, but it's by grace alone. And I've got stuff on there like, it it starts off with a real tough one. Be in bed by 10.30 every night. Get get some sleep, right? Eat right, why? Because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Then it goes on, feed your soul. Be in the word, pray without ceasing. Why? Because you trust what God says about prayer. Up in and out, huh? Be tied to God, be tied to God's people, be tied to to the whole world as as, as you're reaching out the love of Christ. 
Love God, love others. To, to, to practice these things in your life. It's just something that, that, that has helped me through, through this time. Okay? Be content. Okay? Godliness with contentment is a great game. Be content. Trust God. Make God your trust. And so forth. In, uh, this is uh, very much biblical or, or, or Christian, if you will, to have disciplines or, or practices. In fact, we, we've kind of lost this idea, but to be a disciple in the time of Jesus was to look to emulate your master, was to look to live as he did, was to be just as he was. The whole idea of the disciples following Jesus was that they were learning disciplines or practices through which they could grow more and more like their master. And a a number of times, Paul uh, uh, would say things like, uh, uh, mark what we do and how we live and, and copy it. Ever read that in the text? He would say, he said that a couple of times, two or three times in the text. How do you do that? You do it through disciplines. And we have these texts that we read. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is... By the way, I used to, I used to have my kids read this when they asked me to do something that was like a little shady, like, can I go see this movie, right? I said, well, let's read this, and then, and, and then you, you guys can decide, right? So yeah, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, read the rest of me. Put it into practice, right? Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, today, we're going to look at, uh, at five practices that uh, pa- pa- Pastor Finke thinks are, are uh, foundational for living a, a, as a missionary in our society. Um, and, and he says this is not a beginning and end all. This, these are five that, that he has discovered that, that work, and, and if you live in these things, it'll, it'll empower you or bring you to a place where you more and more can join Jesus in his mission. All right? And, and I just want to make the point that disciplines and practices, they're, they're, they're very much part of the biblical record and guide in our lives. Um, first of all, where, where have we been? All right, uh, we, we ended up with these questions. What is Jesus up to, and how is he inviting us to join him? And, and the way we got there is that we, we began to see that, that Jesus' mission is continuing. It didn't end with his life, death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven, right? But rather, in the book of Acts, it says all of that was Jesus just beginning his mission, all right, Luke says, I, I wrote what Jesus began to do and to say. Now, now what he began to do is awesome, right? I mean, he, he did everything, everything that has to be done for our salvation. It is finished, he says on the cross. By grace, we're saved just by trusting him as our Savior. And yet, he has a continuing mission on this earth, and he's, jo- and he's calling us to join him. He's doing all the hard stuff. He's doing all the heavy work. He just wants us to plug in when he gives us opportunities. And then, and then we looked at this, uh, the idea of the time in which we live, uh, it, it called a post-Christian, po- post-modern time, when, when, when our society, where the church is, is no longer power, the po- part of the power structure of our society, when, when, when people more and more and more are, are walking away from the church and, and, and don't think that the church has, has any relevance in their lives, so that no longer can you hold up the side and say, y'all come, but rather you gotta go out and touch their lives, very much like the time of the apostles, by the way, and so we looked at the practice of the apostles. Paul saying, I want to be all things to all people. I want to be all things to all people. And the second one is the methodology of Jesus. Methodology, which is to make relationships. And so we say, in this time in which we live, this very special time that didn't take Jesus by surprise, and the fact that he's put you here for a purpose and a mission, nothing comes by surprise, right? Like that, 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 that ocean, right, of, of knowing that, that God works all things together, it scares us, except that we, we can see it through his grace. So he's put us here for a purpose. And in this time in which we live, we want to be all things to all people, and we go about creating relationships, because that's what Jesus did. And finally, we said we wanted to get our antenna up so we can, we can begin to see Jesus in our world, his work in the kingdom. And we said, where do we look for that? We look for people who are suffering and hurting. As you read the Gospels, you see that's where Jesus always is. He's with those who are asking questions. He's with those who need a little redemption in their life. He's with those who need a little love in their life. He's with those who need healing in their life. We know Jesus is there, and he calls us to join him. 
And then uh, Reverend Fink, uh, Finke, he, he has this transitional paragraph. This goes something like this. Only Jesus can do the Jesus work of redeeming and restoring people. Boy, I, I love this because it just takes the weight off your shoulders. Right? It's Jesus doing the work. Just taking the light weight off your shoulder. Uh, uh, however, he invites us to join him by enjoying the people who is put in our proximity and then seeking, recognizing, and responding to what he is already doing in their lives. And that transition then, he says this, the second part of this book focuses on how we do that. How we do that. And basically he says, hey, I've come up with five practices. It's not the beginning and end all, all right? You could add to these if you want to. He said, but, but these five in, in, in his uh, experience are really, uh, are really something to practice, Okay. So the five practices, daily practices or disciplines that will help to put us in position every day to join Jesus on his mission. It's not a program. It's a lifestyle. It's how we live. Okay? It's how we live. Here's the first one. Seeking the kingdom. And I love this Matthew 6.33. I've looked at that for years, and, and I've known that it was continual action, and I never put it together, but it says be seeking and you will be finding in the Greek. We always memorize that, seek and you will find, as if it's about, as if it's about uh, simply uh, seeking Jesus, coming to faith in Jesus, uh, and, and now I found, the king, I, I found Jesus, so I'm good, right? But that's not how the text plays out. It's be seeking and you will be finding. So it's a continual action. It, I, I think it's because, in, especially in the West, we kind of view faith uh, as, a, um, as a thing I own, as, as uh, uh, something solid, almost like you, you stuck a rock in me so that God's got to like me now because I got this thing called faith, right? But that's not what faith is. Faith, faith, faith is, a, um, is, is a living reality. It's a relationship, right? It's this relationship that we have in Jesus Christ. We have with God through Jesus Christ. It's this, it's this relationship. That's why Martin Luther would say that faith is a living, busy, vital, active thing. It's impossible for it not always to be looking to do good, he says, does that sound like, like something inanimate or alive and living in relationship? Be seeking and you will be finding. Looking for the kingdom. How do you know where it's at? Where there's hurting people, people in need that are right in front of you. You know Jesus is there and he's calling you to join him. And by the way, this can, <laughs> we, we gotta start doing this stuff in our closest of relationships, with our husbands and wives and children and parents, huh? in our families. There was a, a, a seminary uh, um, professor who, who read this book. It's in the front of the book, and he said, he, he said he, it was from St. Louis uh, Seminary, and, and, and he said that, uh, that he was putting this into practice at a family gathering. He'd read it, and then the very next week, and he put this into practice at a family gathering. Seeking, see? Seeking those who are in need. So uh, he says, simply forming the habit or discipline of watching for what God is showing us every day in the midst of our daily routines. This last week, uh, Wednesday night, we, we had the um, s- summer nights thing. You know, it, it was really neat. Uh, but, but we had uh, a couple of the big sandwiches left over uh, that we had for dinner. All right? And, and uh, folks wanted me to take one home, and I said, you know, I'm just one person. It's, got, it's, it's not really. But, but finally I took one, cause, and I thought, what am I going to do with this? You know, I, I can't possibly eat all this thing. I thought, well, if there's a neighbor, maybe I can give it away to a neighbor. Um, and so as I was coming in uh, to, my, uh, to my house across the street, I noticed that the, uh, the, this kid was home. He's like out of college trying to be a firefighter, and he's in and out, right? And so I thought, well, I bet he can eat it, right, because he's a big, strong kid. And, and, and so I take it over to him, uh, and, and he says, oh, we can really use this around here. I said, oh, oh, you know, and, I, and anyway, his, his dad has been in the hospital for three days. Right, and, and the whole family's there, and, and, I'm, and so I, it's just like, whoa, this is amazing. And, and he starts to talk to me, and, he, and I just sit and listen, and he's laying out uh, uh, his struggle, right? And at the end of that time, we have a prayer. We have a prayer together. You think all that just happened? What do you think God put that right in front of me? What do you think? Be seeking, and you will continue finding I love this verse from John 3, a person can receive only what is given him from heaven. Again, it takes, it takes the load off. <laughs> doesn't mean that, that I gotta find something, I gotta find something. He says, no, just open your eyes, see what Jesus brings you. 
And, and, and you know what? It may not be what you draw up on the chalkboard. It may not be what you draw up and say, this is what I think it ought to look like. It might be something totally, it'll, it might knock you off your socks. Oh, right in front of me, I can do something here. Seeking the kingdom, trusting in God's providence and in his grace through that providence. Here, here's number two. Hearing from Jesus. Uh, he, he quotes the gospel lesson. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. And uh, I, I've been amazed as I've read the gospels lately how often Jesus says something like that. Not only hearing his words, but putting them into practice, doing them, acting on them. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, believe and you will see the kingdom of God. And then he raised Lazarus from the dead. When the man came to him and, and said, uh, please heal my daughter, and he says, believe and it'll be done. And he says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So we're not going to do it perfect, are we? But we can begin. When Jesus sent the disciples out two by two, he said, I want you to preach the gospel. I, I, I want you to heal people. I want you to throw out demons. Now, what do, you, what do you think would have happened if they thought, well, let's sit down and philosophically talk about this a little bit, huh? Now, now what is Jesus asking us to do? Well, you know, that sounds really good. You know, I, I believe what he says is good. Is that what belief's all about? Or is it about taking that step of faith, See? The disciples took that step and went out. And then they came back and they said, whoa, Jesus, I gotta tell you everything that's happening out there, right? People are coming to faith in you. People are getting well. We're casting out demons. Man, this is crazy. <laughs> Read the text. That's about what they say. When Peter steps out on the water, you know, we always focus on the idea that he started sinking and that Jesus had to rescue him. But the guy walked on water. You ever wonder what that might be like? I, I, I remember I, sometimes, <laughs> a long time ago, I was a kid, but, but I, I had a pool I was at, and I kept stepping out, fig, trying to figure what that would be like. You see, he believed Jesus' words. Oh, he, his, his faith failed him, all right? And Jesus had to rescue him by grace. He always got grace, see, but he walked on water because he believed his words and he acted on them. I don't care, it was for three steps, the dude walked on water. What do you think you can do if you trust his words and take three steps with it? And if you fall flat on your face, you know what? His grace is there to pick you up. Reading the Gospels and, and seeing in there Jesus' words and asking what they mean as I live out my life. And then to do it. Because faith is not a stayed dead object. It's a living relationship. So uh, uh, the author would say in Matthew 7, that's the, the text that we're looking at, Jesus is moving beyond information, simply hearing his words, to transformation, finding out what happens when we put them into practice. You know, this is not something new in the lives of Christians for uh, at least as long as I've been alive, Okay. Um, oftentimes when a church is focusing on stewardship, they, they, have, uh, they have someone come forward, maybe two, three, four people in the congregation come forward because these folks have stepped out in faith and stewardship and they want to tell people about it. They want to tell people that it works, that it really works. You can trust God in his word, it works. And the rest of us, we feel uncomfortable, right? But it does work. You can step out in faith. God does keep his word. Now translate that to being a missionary in our life. To opening our eyes to see the kingdom, seeing the hurt, joining Jesus in that place and seeing what he'll do. It works. Seek and you will find. Be seeking and you will continue to find. This is not far away from what we've always been talking about. Finding out what actually happens when we put the teaching of Jesus into practice transforms us. If you find someone who has been transformed in this way in their life of stewardship, man, will they tell you about it. But it's not just in that little compartment of our lives called stewardship. And, and actually, that's our whole life. I, I know that. But it's with, in, in our entire Christian life as we're seeking to live in his kingdom and to join him in this mission.
Okay, next one. Uh, Re- Reverend Finke would, would continue with this. He would say, what makes one wise and another foolish? One puts the words of Jesus into practice and is changed by what he finds out and the other is not. The more we put his words and practice into play, the more confidence we gain in him. It feels more and more that we are standing on rock rather than sand. Start taking the risk of putting Jesus' words into practice. I was, um, in, in the Gospel of, of Mark, I was reading uh, the Palm Sunday entrance. And that's, that's the Gospel where he tells his two disciples to, to go into the town and there they'll find a donkey and undo the donkey, and if anybody says anything to you, you say the Lord has need of it. Now that, that would be akin to me walking into Sacramento, and he says, you'll see a, you, you, you'll see a, uh, a Mercedes Benz there, and, and the keys will be in it, so you just hop in and bring it to me, and if anybody says anything, right, you just say, hey, hey, the, the, the Lord needs it, right? But they believed him, and they acted on those words. How much do you think it strengthened them? You see it everywhere in the Gospels. Not just hearing it, but acting on the words. Start taking the risk of putting Jesus' words into practice. There's a little prayer here. Uh, it, it go, uh, let, let, let's read this together, okay? Uh, in fact, let's pray it together. I hope you can all see it. I know it's a little small, but, but let's try it. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus, what would you have me believe and do as a result of your words today? When you, when you take that time and in your closet and, and, and you're looking at his word, it's a great prayer to end by, all right? All right, here's the next one. Talking with people. Um, this is like common sense stuff, but when 53% of the people don't have anybody to talk to, it, maybe we ought to say that, huh? I, I loved what he wrote. He said this. He said, Jesus can do more with two people who are talking with each other than he can with two people who are successfully ignoring each other. You like that? I know that our lives are busy, and and sometimes we're really tired. I mean, we're played out emotionally, psychologically, however you want to say that. But if we open our eyes and we see the opportunity to connect with someone who's hurting, this is how we do it. We we open our mouths and we have conversation, and, and more than anything else, we listen. We listen. This, uh, this young man that, that I gave a sandwich to, I, I was so amazed because he just started pouring out what was happening in his life. And all I had to do was sit there and listen. And, and, and I really had to smile because I don't anymore believe that, that, that things that happen without God being there. We call those divine appointments. And, and we, used to, we used to say, well, there's just a few of them. No, our whole life is moved by God. And he brings us to a place where we can connect where he's working with people. Lots of times, he wants us just to sit and listen. And if you're an introvert or an extrovert, you know what? It doesn't matter. Just as you are, God will use you. By the way, how many of you think you're introverts? I, I know I'm an introvert. I know you don't believe that, but I know I'm an introvert, Right? I love what he said about introverts being able to listen a little better, okay? But the extroverts are able to talk a little better, right? So God uses us and puts us right where we're needed. Go ahead. He continues, he says, first, we need to start noticing the people God has regularly placed in proximity to us. Who's already there? You ever think about the people on your blog? People that you see every day, you, you kind of wave to as, as, as you're leaving sometimes? How about the people you work with? Whatever community you're in, whatever neighborhood you're in, the people you work with, the people you play golf with. Maybe that when, when, when you go to the grocery store, the person seems to always check you out there. If, if you don't you use the, 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 the uh, self-check lines, right? Even there, there's usually somebody running it, right? I've had to go shopping more than I ever have in my whole life, like for 25 years or whatever. I'm getting to know these people now. It's amazing. It seems like the same ones are already there. That's not just my life. That's your life. Who's God putting in front of you? All right, here's the next one. Um, uh, Turns out talking with people is less about talking than it is about listening. Why listen? To find out what Jesus is already doing in their lives. To find out. When I, um, 
I'll never, it's happened every time I've gone to Hungary. Uh, it's, it's kind of a wonderful culture there. People who are good friends of my kids, of uh, Sarah and Tamash, they have us all over as if we're family. And they have this big meal, and, and, we, and we stay there for, like, for, for most of the evening. And, and I, 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 I talk, but mostly I listen, and sooner or later they start asking me all right, stuff that really matters. Questions about hope, questions about God. If you're just patient and, and listen, you, you'll find out what God is doing in their lives. And, and I, I need to say this, sincere, genuine, compassionate, real, caring, authentic. We're not putting on here. Uh, um, you always go back to, to that personal prayer that God would make you compassionate and loving and real and authentic to people. Because that's the heart of Christ, isn't it? That's why he died on the cross, and, and we want to be like Jesus. All right, here's the fourth one. Doing good. What if the random acts of kindness weren't so random? What if the unplanned good we go around doing for people is actually planned out by God? Did you catch this? I, don't, I, I hope, are some of you reading the book? I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. I love this part of the book. I, I, I really did. Uh, you know, the Ephesians 2, 2 text starts at verse 8. It goes, uh, by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of good works, as anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Created to do good works which God in, had prepared in advance for us to do. I've memorized that since I was a kid, right? But we always seem to look at those good works as being a, a, a staid, a, 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 almost a philosophical thing. You know what I mean? And he said, no, you know what? If God is preparing good, has prepared good works for us, why don't we open our eyes and see what those are supposed to be? Why don't we open our eyes and see who he's bringing into our life that we can show something good to, that we can show a little Christ's redemption to, that we can love in Jesus' name a little bit, that we can have his touch of love, his purpose, that we can show them the purpose of Jesus in their lives. You see, things are alive. Jesus Christ is alive and moving. Our faith wasn't meant to be stayed and dead, but alive and moving. And you can trust God through all of it because he's orchestrating the whole thing. It's not about you measuring up. It's about you just living your life and opening your eyes. And when you have opportunity to good, know that it's God the one who has prepared that opportunity for you. This practice begins with us looking for the good we can do, a word of hope, an act of kindness, an attitude of grace, a little time, a little help. Jesus talked about a cup of cold water. To the least of these, you've done unto me, didn't he? Where's God giving you opportunity to do good that he's prepared from before time began just for you in that moment? Here's the last one, ministering in prayer. Prayer is not so much about getting our words right as it is about inviting our king into our trouble. Now I have to tell you, I, I learned this, I wasn't here very long, maybe a couple of years, and a pastor named Hank Scherer, he, um, he shared with me how, because uh, we all do that, we all say I'll pray for you and then I have a list of, prayer, I have a list of folks and I, and, I, and I pray for them, you know. Um, but he says, you know, uh, what he, fa- he says, I just pray right then. He says, I, I pray for that person right then, I put my arm on his shoulder, and, and, and I pray right then, and, and, and you know, I started doing that. And it's so funny, last, or, or two days ago, uh, Hank happened to call me, his wife was in the hospital having her spine um, completely remade somehow, it's really bad, uh, and I had the opportunity to pray with him on the phone. And I said, Hank, you're the one that taught me how to do this. Yeah. I remember the first time I did that, uh, I was, I, it was quite a number of years ago, and, and I was still working out at Gold's Gym, and there was this gal, I was, I was on the, one of these machines, and I really wanted to finish my workout, you know, because I'd worked so hard to get to the point where, where I was going to be able to do what I wanted to do, and she came up, and she talked to me, and she, uh, and, and she really was going through some, through some heavy stuff, and I, I remember I hesitated just a couple seconds, I thought, oh man, I wanted to, f- okay, I can't do that, and, 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 I, and now I think I was so stupid, because she's so much more important than finishing the workout, right? I mean, this is stupid stuff she's more important and, and I remember I had the opportunity it's the first time I did it after I after I talked with Hank and I put my hand on her shoulder I had a prayer with her and it was so amazing now lots of times we say um, well how do I know if I'm praying right 
well, that can't be me because I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a good, I, I don't know what it means to pray right. You know what the Bible says in Romans 8? Go home and read this for me, okay? It says in Romans 8 that we, that yes, it's true, we don't even know how to pray. We don't know what to ask for. But then it says that the Holy Spirit takes our prayers and makes them perfect before the throne of grace. That's what it says. Check me up. Romans 8, the Holy Spirit takes our prayers and makes them perfect before the throne of grace. Now, do you think he can do that if we never pray? On the other hand, if we pray, you think he's going to do that? Even if it's not perfect? Even if you just, if you blow it? <laughs> you think he's going to take that prayer? If that's his promise, right? And then on top of it, it says in James that the prayer of a righteous person availeth much or, or, or does great stuff. Uh, righteous. What does that mean? We're each of us who believes in Jesus are declared righteous through faith in him, right? This is every single one of us, our prayers will accomplish great things. But he said, here's the word of God and does it, right? Isn't that what we're talking about? Stepping out on the water. It's so powerful in a person's life. You, I, I, I believe that's true. You, you bring Jesus into a person's life, the kingdom, when you pray for them right then. This last Wednesday night on this, this young man's porch, I had that experience again. It is all filled, and it's not... It's just about God doing his thing. Don't ever be afraid of praying. God just says, pray. I'll make it perfect before the throne of grace. And your prayers accomplish awesome things. So I have one little addendum, and then we'll, and then we'll be done. The addendum is, do I, have all time, uh, do I have enough time for this? All right, do I have time for this? I, I don't know if you caught that if you read the book, but do I have time for this? Uh, and and he, said, he said, you know what? Uh, the, the text, uh, the Matthew 28 text, go, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. He says, you know that, and, and he's absolutely true. Uh, uh, Dr. Bunkowski was the first, he was a missiologist in the seminary I went to. He was the first one I saw who translated that, uh, the, the words in this way. He says, what they really mean is, as you go or while you are going, make disciples. In other words, as you go about your, 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 your normal life, wherever God takes you, you're going to work, okay, you make disciples there. You go to school, okay, you're making disciples there. You, you, you're, you're at home with your wife, okay, you're discipling each other. You're with the kids, you're discipling each other. Wherever you're at, see, wherever you're at, wherever God takes you, you go on a cruise, you're going to disciple people there. Wherever you're at, whatever neighborhood you're a part of, see, wherever you can create relationship, however that works, just as you're going along, you make disciples. It, and and that, that takes the burden off of you. God's at work. He just calls you to join him wherever he takes you. As you're going. In, uh, in the book, he, he said that for a, a couple of months or whatever, he, he took a, a running tab of how much, it, how much time it took him in the day. He said, almost always just a few minutes. He says, once in a while is a half hour. But almost always just a few minutes in a day. To live missionally. To open our eyes and see Jesus at work and to have the excitement of joining him in those places. So while you're going through your day, just practice these things. Make them part of your disciplines. So this week, in the grace you know in Jesus, start intentionally practicing the five practices. Seeking the kingdom, hearing from Jesus and doing it. Huh? Talking to people, doing good, ministering in prayer, and then see what God will do. And as, as he said, um, starting is what stops most people. Just start it. And every day, begin brand new. Because that's what grace is all about. Just start it. And every day, begin brand new. Amen. Now may the peace of God which pass all understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith to life never ending. Amen.